Hello everyone, my name is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Designs in Computer Science, Topic 5, Multiple Comparisons. In this video, before we enter multiple comparisons, I will talk about non-normal data, which is a topic that I think it will be interesting and important for many of you in your experiments. So let's get started. So uh, the idea of non-normality is that until now we studied test statistics which assume that the estimator, which is the variable that you under study, is calculated from the sample comes from a normal distribution or close enough. However, in some cases this assumption does not hold. When this happens, how can we perform the statistical analysis of the result? So let's see an example. Okay, Let's say that a researcher is examining two different diets diet A and diet B, and wants to compare the weight loss by people following one diet or another diet. So they obtain the following data. There are 10 people that tried diet A, and there are 10 people that tried diet B. As you can see here, the 10 people that tried diet A, one of them has this huge outlier. They lost 300 kilos. I have no idea how this happened. It could be actually a person that had a very big weight or much more likely, it probably was uh, and, uh, an entry error. If we don't know, but well, we have to deal with this data somehow. So how first, before we think about how to deal with this data, let's see what happens when we have a huge outlier like this, okay? Of course, in the research, and we're going to talk about this later, when we see a huge outlier like this, we have to ask, why does this outlier exist? Or is it an error? Is it an error on the data input? Is it a new discovery? But right now in this video, let's focus on how we treat this error from a statistical point of view. So this is the data with the outlier. And you can see that when we include the outlier, uh, the two samples, they get really, really close. When we remove the outlier, though, we can see that the samples look very different. Now, without looking at the graph, if we just put the two data in a t-test without thinking too much, what would happen? So here we do a t-test with both of the data, and we see that the t-test give us a p-value of 0.6, and the 95 confidence interval of the difference between the two samples is between minus 80 and 50. So we have a huge confidence interval with the zero in the middle. We have a very high p-value. So all in the t-test indicates to us that we cannot see a clear difference between this data. So, but as you can see here, uh, the data is actually quite different. The two samples are actually quite different. So what do we do when we identify an outlier in this data? Okay, so if we analyze the data and we find out that the outlier is an experimental error. Uh, for example, someone just put an extra zero there when they wrote the data, or maybe the measure was broken. Then it makes sense to just remove the outlier from the data if it's an error in the experiment. However, uh, sometimes the outlier is not an error in the experiment, it's actually an important effect that needs to be included in the analysis. Well, in the case of the diet, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it can be like, for instance, some medicine that someone is very, very affected by that medicine or something like that. Of course, um, it's possible to use statistical methods that are not sensitive to that outlier. What the outlier is doing is that the outlier is violating the assumption of normality and the assumption of equality of variances. So if we can use a statistical method that does not make those assumptions, then we can do the analysis of the data with that outlier. So the way to do that is using non-parametric tests. Non-parametric tests use statistics that come from non-parametric distributions. In this case, a non-parametric test will indicate the difference between the location shift of the two examples. So what is the location shift? The idea of the location shift is that instead of comparing the exact value, we compare the order of the values between the two samples 
and we see which of the samples have more has more values that come first and which of the samples has more values that come after so one example is the Wilcoxon test and we can run like this Wilcoxon test of diet A and diet B and the Wilcoxon rank sum test will give us a p-value of 001 saying that the true location the true shift location is not zero in other words this means that one of these the two data has values that is much lower than the other and we can measure that later so we're going to talk more about the Wilcoxon test later in this video but right now uh, let's talk about how data can violate the assumption of normality so as we saw, well, the data can, uh, can uh, violate the assumption of normality when there are some special observations like an outlier or a data collection error, or when there are absolute limits on the data. For example, if you are measuring the amount of time that it takes for a program to run, well, let's say that the mean amount of time is one second. But even if the data followed a normal distribution and the mean was one second, we could have two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, depending on the variance. But we cannot have minus one second, minus two seconds. Unless you're testing a time machine, your program will not run in negative time. This means that your normal distribution will not be normal anymore. You're going to have one of the tails cut off. Okay? So this means that you cannot, the, the, normality, the normality assumption will not hold. We also have some extreme non-normal distributions, like the power distribution, which we usually see when we measure things like number of Twitter followers, or number of likes in social media, or number of people that are connected to other people, right? We also have the Cauchy distribution, and these distributions, they are non-normal, and they are very extreme, so even the CLT sometimes does not deal with them very well. Uh, we also have ordinal data, and the ordinal data is very important. Ordinal data is data that can be ordered and compared, but you cannot apply traditional algebra on it. We're going to talk about this later. And we also have no numerical data, like for instance, colors. If the result of your experiment is a color, the colors don't follow a normal distribution. So you don't, you cannot use a parametric test on that. So let's talk a little bit about where no normal data comes from. If we talk about random process in nature, they usually follow a normal distribution or a bell curve or something close enough. However, random artificial process not always follow a normal. Well, pseudo -num random number generators, when you, we use our software that has, has some PNG, PRNG in it, they follow our uniform distribution, and uniform distribution usually aggregate into normal distribution. So we don't have to worry about those. But random social processes, like we said, follow Twitter followers, etc., or salaries, they follow power distributions or binomial distributions that sometimes may violate the CLT, and you need to be careful around those. Uh, then we talked about Likert data. So Likert data is data like this. Computer can simplify complex problems, and then we have like strongly agree, slightly agree, strongly disagree. Okay? Now, why cannot we treat this as a numerical? We could think that maybe, okay, this is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three, and then we can take the average, they can take the standard deviation, right? Well, it is possible, but we have some problems. For example, values outside of the zero five range have, have no meaning. And if you remember, the normal distribution, it has a long tail. So, well, the, it's cut, it's like time data, it's cut at the edges. Also, algebra data has no meaning. For instance, if we have one neutral and one disagree, what, is the, what does it mean to add neutral with disagree? If we have two measures of time, like five seconds and six seconds, we can say that the average between five and six seconds is 5.5 seconds. But what is the average between slightly agree and disagree? It doesn't make sense. Also, the difference between levels is not clear. We don't know if, like, this, is disagree closer to slightly disagree or is it closer to strongly disagree? So, when our data does not follow the normality assumption, there are many strategies that we can follow, depending on the type of the data and by how much the normality assumption is violated. 
well. Sometimes we can just do nothing. We can just remove the outliers, or we can trust that the test that we're using is robust, or that the data will survive, the, the CLT will deal with that problem. And that's something that we usually can do with small violations of normality. But we need to be careful, and we need to know that these violations exist and pay attention to the results to see if the results make sense. We can also transform the data. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. We can do non-parametric testing. I talked about this in the beginning of the video. I'm going to talk more about non-parametric tests later. Or sometimes we can just go and study and see other tests that exist, like look for a book on non-parametric statistics. So let's talk about data transformation. Let's say that we have like a log normal distribution like this. Okay, if we apply the log transform on this data, our data will become normal and beautiful like this, and we can apply our parametric tests and be happy. Okay, and you can see some code to do that here. So if the data has a strong skew in the sampling distribution, well, this is a problem for standard statistical tests, but you can use some transformation to remove the skill. So we can use the square root or the cube root to when we have left skew data, or when we have right skew data, we can use the square root uh, with a minus x constant to transform the data. Um, however, when we have a, when we are using logarithmic transformation, the logarithmic of zero and negative data is not defined, so you need to be a little bit careful when you're using these transformations. Now, when we transform the data and we apply a test on that transformed data, we need to be careful of how we describe this. This transformation needs to be described in the analysis. So we say, oh, we applied a t-test on the log transformed data because of the skill, and these are the results on the log transformed data. In particular, the meaningful difference must be discussed on the original data, not on the transformed data. So we remember that we discussed that when we do a test, besides the um, reject or not reject the new hypothesis, and of course the hypothesis will be on the transformed data, but when we do the analysis, we have to go back to the original data to see if the uh, difference is meaningful or not. Also notice that sometimes the hypotheses are not equivalent, because the log normal data, the, the mean of the log normal includes the variance. So, but the transform does not. So the new hypothesis is only equivalent when the variance of the distributions is equal. So we need to be a little bit careful about that. Now, another way to transform, which is interesting, is to put the CLT to work and use a method called bootstrapping. So the bootstrapping trust procedure is a very nice procedure that can be used to obtain an approximation of the sample mean distribution from the sample data. We basically take a sample from the data and we use the, these means of the sample, we take several samples and we use the mean of all the samples as our transformed data. It kind of works like this. So we have a lot of data, we take a sample and we repeat this procedure many times. Now we take a mean of each of these samples and we draw this bootstrap distribution and because of the CLT, this bootstrap distribution will usually be normal and we can apply our parametric tests here. This is good to aggregate data. Um, aggregate data. So there is a package boot in R that can do this uh, bootstrapping for us. So you can look how we can use the boot uh, package to do uh, bootstrapping of data. And we can transform like our date, this bootstrap city is has a bunch of data and some uh, outliers and it becomes this nice. So if we have like a data that is almost normal but has some outliers and you can do bootstrapping to try to remove the effect of those. Then we have non-parametric tests. I mentioned non-parametric tests in the beginning of the video. They involve statistics that do not assume normality from the population. Actually, non-parametric tests tend to assume very little about the population, so they are very usually very useful. Um, the counterpart of that is that non-parametric tests are usually less powerful than parametric tests because they make few assumptions about the data. So you're going to trade power for the uh, need to assume things about your data. Okay. So we have the Wilcoxon sign rank when we have one sample. We have the Wilcoxon rank sum test or the main Whitley test when we have two samples. So this would be equivalent to the one sample test, the two sample tests. 
And for multiple samples, we have the Kruskal-Wallis test. And we are going to talk about multiple samples in the next video. So let's talk about the mann whitley u test, which is an unpaired test for two samples. So let's say that we have these two samples, the red and the blue, and to calculate its test, we need to calculate this u value. This is the statistic that we are going to analyze. Okay? So the u value is calculated as followed. We choose one of the samples and we sum the number of sample or the number of observations from the other sample that are above this. So for instance, this one has zero above it, this one has two above it, this one has three above it, and this one has four above it. So our u is zero plus two plus three plus four that equals to nine. And then we calculate the u prime, which is the same thing, but it's based on the other. So it's like 1, 2, plus 2, 4, plus 3, 7, plus 4, 11. And we know that if we add them together, we have n1 times n2, the size of the two samples multiplied. When two values are exactly the same, we count it as 0 0.5. So, okay, we have this u statistic. What we do we do with it? So the idea is that first we choose the smaller of u or u prime. And the new hypothesis is that both of the samples come from the same distribution. If both of the samples come from the same distributions, then under the new hypothesis, for a big enough n1 and n2, u will follow roughly a normal distribution. So we are transforming these into a normal distribution. So u follows roughly a normal distribution with mean n1 times n2 divided by 2 and variance n1 times n2 plus this is the formula of the variance. Now, now that we have the u and now that we have our normal, we can do the z statistic with the z test that we discussed in the first class and then we can calculate a p-value and an alpha percentile and everything that we like. Now, the Wilcoxon sign rank test is when we have two samples that we are, um, it's another way when we have two samples to compare, right? So we have two groups, and for each group we count the winning and the losses, okay? So we have this first group, the left, the right wins, then the left wins three times, then the right wins. So the Wilcoxon test takes the relative difference between pairs, positive and negative. The new hypothesis is that the positive and negative signs are equally likely. So if they come from the same distribution, we would have a same number of positive and negatives on both sides. So we compare the number of signs, positive and negative, against a binomial distribution under the new hypothesis. We can use this code in R to calculate uh, the Wilcoxon sign rank test, which compare two samples. So if you want to learn more about these topics, here are some recommended reading. So the first one is a general idea of the different ways that we can deal with non-normal data that I took some of the ideas for this class. And then about log transformation, there is a discussion of about, about log transformation for data analysis here. And finally, here is the uh, about sometimes it's better just to do nothing. It's like, should we really need to transform the data to make it normal? So it's interesting to have a very interesting discussion about when the normality assumption is violated or not. So I recommend you to read these articles to learn more about the ways of thinking for this lecture. All right, this ends the first video of non-normal data. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. There is a lot more to be taught about non-parametric statistics, and but um, we are going to next video. We're going to talk about another interesting topic, which is what to do when we have multiple samples that we want to compare one against the other. So see you in the next video. Bye-bye.